Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Okay. My name is Mike Johnston, and I'm uh, the owner of Morse Telecommunication, the publisher of uh, the Slackware Professional Linux product and uh, the Linux Quarterly CD-ROM. And uh, the organizers invited me here today to speak just a little bit about Linux and what it is, what it does, and what my company does. Uh, mostly, I think, because everyone else of note is either in California or Finland. Um, I first discovered Linux about a year and a half ago on the internet. And uh, I was initially fairly skeptical about its usability because uh, uh, there are an awful lot of things out there that have a, a lot of promise but usually don't pan out to be what they're uh, touted to be. Well, I've, I've got a pretty good background in system administration, uh, work with Xenix, uh, System 5, uh, BSD, SCO, and so forth. So I pretty much knew what was involved in putting one of those systems together. Um, and that, I suppose, was the basis of my skepticism. But uh, nevertheless, I, I downloaded a copy of uh, the original soft landing system version off the internet. And uh, I was fairly surprised. Uh, it was a very complete system. It uh, essentially had all the features that I was used to uh, in standard versions of Unix. Uh, the compilers were there, X-Windows, uh, development libraries, and all, most of the other internet tools which had been around for you know, years were already compiled and running under Linux. So essentially, th it was a very complete version of the operating system, and uh, uh, I was surprised, to say the least. So I started, I started by putting it on floppy disks, because at the time, I think it was about uh, 30 disks worth or so, which was even then still quite a handful, especially if you only have a 9600 baud connection to the internet to, to download. So little did I know what I was getting myself into because uh, my phone started ringing and the next thing I knew I was copying thousands of floppy disks by hand. Uh, I didn't have any duplicating equipment or, <laughs> or anything and I wore out quite a number of floppy drives in the process. Uh, a little later on I decided to start putting it on CD-ROM. And uh, not having ever put anything on CD-ROM and not knowing how to do it didn't really stop me. <laughs> um, let me just say that if you, you really haven't lived until you've uh, put something on a non-erasable media and spent your last $2,000 doing it. <laughs> um, so it. Nevertheless, it worked. And I learned pretty quickly how to do that. So uh, we haven't had any problems with our CDs so far. And that's essentially how my company, Morse Telecommunication, got into the, uh, the Linux publishing business. Um, a little later on, I decided that I, I felt the operating system was ready, pr pr pretty much ready for prime time. Uh, it needed better documentation, or at least a more coherent package uh, to be made available to, to the general user rather than just the internet uh, connected uh, techie. So what we did was we contacted uh, Patrick Volkening, the, uh, the author of Slackware, uh, Slackware Linux, which is currently the most popular version of Linux uh, available on the internet. And we proposed to him that what we would do would be to basically create an official distribution of uh, Slackware and put it on CD-ROM, uh, provide it with documentation, add uh, technical support, which is, which is something I think uh, uh, most people generally expect when they when they spend fifty or seventy five dollars or whatever for a pre uh, created distribution, which is is what we did. So uh, uh, taking it from there, he jumped at the idea, and uh, that was how Slackware uh, Professional, the Slackware Professional product, uh, was born. Slackware Professional is essentially the same version of Linux that you can get on the internet. Uh, the key differences with that package are that you can run it directly from the CD-ROM and run it cleanly uh, with using as little as 8 megabytes of a native Linux partition or 11 megabytes of an uncompressed MS-DOS partition. Uh, the bulk of the rest of the operating system, X Windows, uh, the internet stuff, the compilers and all will run from CD. Of course, the, be the faster the CD-ROM drive you have, the better. You don't want to start compiling kernels with uh, a single speed CD-ROM drive. Um, so that's what, we, that's what we did. We put that together with the, uh, the manuals which had been written by the Linux documentation project. Uh, had them professionally printed and, and typeset. Um, decided to beef up our tech support a little bit, added some extra lines. Um, and basically went out and pressed uh, 5,000 of them to start. Uh, as of right now, the thing is uh, moving out faster than we, we can even imagine. I, I can't 
even begin to guess, guess the number of users that are, are currently using Linux uh, actively, whether that's uh, 50,000, 100,000. It's all over the place. And uh, since there's no unified source of getting it, you can get it anywhere you want, and you don't have to register it when you get it, um, who knows, there could be a quarter of a million. I w estimates range from 100,000 to 200,000 at Varys. But uh, it's all over the place. And uh, you'll find it all over the place. So it's out there. And uh, what, that's what we do, basically, is we, we provide it on CD-ROM. We update it frequently. Uh, we try and track the bugs that we discover through the customers that call us for, uh, for assistance. Uh, report those back to the developers. Uh, try and, and get the documentation enhanced, the, uh, uh, the aspects of the installation that have problems. We, we attempt to uh, uh, resolve those difficulties by first determining whether or not it was the user that uh, maybe did something wrong uh, or if it was the installation process itself. And from there, uh, we communicate that back to the developers and uh, essentially act as a buffer between the developers uh, and the end users so that they don't have to be answering thousands of questions because as the install base of Linux users grows, we're finding that uh, the developers uh, and ourselves as well are getting literally hundreds of email messages a day and that's going to continue to grow. So, so now that we've, we've uh, at least partially removed the burden of support uh, from Pat Volkening, the author of Slack, where uh, he's pretty much off chasing the Grateful Dead around Chicago these days. Um, for those who are interested, Bob, Bob Young here, the publisher of uh, New York Unix and uh, owner of the ACC Bookstore, has a table set up out in the area over there where you can take a look at the, uh, the Slackware Pro uh, product as well as uh, some of the other Linux-related products that he's got, the Infomagic, the Linux Quarterly, books, and so forth. Uh, since I seem to spend most of my time these days answering questions on a telephone, I really haven't had a chance to, pre to prepare anything uh, long-winded to bore you with today. Uh, so at this time, you know, I'll open the floor. Uh, we'll take questions about Linux, what it is that my firm does. Uh, maybe you have some technical Linux questions uh, or what have you, and uh, it's up to you. Uh, you, sir. Do you have a um, package like Mosaic? Mosaic, unfortunately, is not free software. Um, the NCSA doesn't want it redistributed on a CD-ROM without royalties being paid back to the NCSA. We're currently working on uh, licensing that for the CD, but at this time it's not on the CD because of that. There is a gopher replacement uh, called Lynx, uh, which uh, I, I actually think is quite better than the, the original gopher program. Uh, that's on there, so you have gopher services. And, and what about uh, emulation? Emulation. Okay, there is DOS, DOS emulator on there called DOS MU. Windows emulation is uh, currently being worked on. Uh, the project is called Wine, and uh, they have said that there will be no wine before it's time. So that's, that's not available yet either. It may be a few months. Apparently it runs uh, some limited uh, MS-DOS applications. I'm very much looking forward to that because uh, operating system sales tend to be driven by applications. In other words, people want to know, does it run uh, uh, Excel, or does it run Word, or does it run their favorite applications? And if it does, they really don't care what the underlying operating system is. But if, if it offers them more performance or greater advantages, they will, they will, uh, they will choose that. So, does that answer your question? OK. Uh, that gentleman back right there. OK. The new format for the file system. The guy. Okay. Um, otherwise, it's read the source. So. <laughs> yeah, I would probably say much the same myself. I've never been asked that question. Unfortunately, I, I, most of the questions that I get asked generally fall into the how come it doesn't install in my system variety. But we do get uh, com various compiler questions uh, and questions uh, in other areas. Uh, you might want to try sending uh, Linus himself some email and get a response in six months about that. <laughs> He's, he's one of the people that get a few hundred messages a day. Okay. Sir. One, one uh, comment just on what he said, then I've got a question. There's another uh, World Wide Web graphical interface out there called Chimera, uh -huh. uh, which works well. It's, uh, it doesn't use, it also doesn't use the motif libraries, and it's free on the net, so that may be something you want. Is that, is that a new development? I haven't seen uh, that. It's been out 
from yeah. Well, you can get Mosaic, and Mosaic will run under Linux. You just, we just... Yeah, Mosaic's on Sunset, Tumor's on Sunset. Yeah. You just can't put it on CD-ROM and distribute it that way. That's why uh, um, it's not on there. My, other, my question, though, is, and this is for anybody who might know, uh, do you know if there's any development or uh, compatibility in the kernel for PCI? Uh, that's going to come along. I just recently saw an announcement uh, about a week ago for SCSI drivers for PCI. The problem with that is that PCI um, is still sort of leading edge, uh, maybe not to you and I, but to the people who have to buy the machines, namely the developers, and the developers don't all have PCI machines. Uh, we're making sure that Pat Volkerding gets one, but he's, he doesn't write uh, uh, kernel drivers. We try and support the, uh, the developers of, of uh, various as aspects of Linux, and we support them uh, to that end. Okay? Can we have a quick uh, show of hands of how many people in the audience are using Linux? Uh, how many people here are using Linux uh, or have tried Linux, I suppose? Anybody try FreeBSD? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are thinking of trying Linux after today? Okay, so that I guess gets the rest of them. Okay. <laughs> so. Question about the differences between the releases of Linux. I know there's an Intersil release. I don't believe it's related to Slackware. No. Many different releases of Linux. Okay. There are at least four or five different versions of Linux distributions that you can download off the internet. The most popular is, is still the Slackware distribution. Um, second, and these numbers, um, or these, this order I'm giving you is based on the numbers that were published uh, in the Linux Journal a few months ago. It may have changed. I suspect Slackware is even more popular these days because it's gotten easier to install. Uh, but uh, with number Slackware, SLS, soft landing systems, which is one of the first uh, comprehensive Linux distributions. Uh, then there is MC MCC from the Manchester Computing Center, which is more of a stripped down uh, version, which people use to install as a base system and then build their own Linux system from there. Uh, and then there's another version called Debian, uh, which is being worked on right now and is uh, uh, being touted as the next uh, Slackware, supposedly. Uh, now, I may have missed one or two. There's, there are enhancements to that, like the JE enhancements to Linux and so forth. But then there are the commercial distributions, of which there are several. Uh, the, uh, the Yggdrasil distribution, the LGX distribution is one of them. Uh, that's a separate and distinct distribution. Um, and I suspect that there is at least two more, one from Nascent Technologies, uh, and the other one from, I think, from a company called Red Hat, although I haven't seen anything that's, that's still to be determined what that is. Okay. Yes? Second question. Now, how is, um, do you know about the interoperability, interoperability between different um, releases? Uh, what's the difference between Linux and Debian? Is there any difference between Linux and Debian? Let's say you originally installed the system and you had an Atrisol release on kernel, and you download like, the newest Slackware release, um, and you start to compile it, it seems to work, and it might be some problems. Do you know how, um, how easy it is, how problems may be? Um, what do you mean by combining them into the same file system? Um, well, let's say you're operating a system and you decide to get like the newest release. <coughs> well, it's better not to, if you're going to switch between major Linux distributions, it's better just to back up the files that you need to save and then install the next one. It would just be too much of a headache. If you want to upgrade your distribution, you can either go out and get the packages you want upgraded piecemeal, which is, which is fine, uh, or get the next version of the distribution. Slackware, in recent versions, has offered rudimentary upgrade capabilities, so you can upgrade individual packages and so forth. Okay. Uh, Novell was working on a package supposedly with uh, using Linux, uh, I believe, for internet access. Right. The, the word on, on that was it was more hearsay than anything else. I don't know uh, what the current state of development was. They were going to, it, the project was codenamed Corsair, Corsair, Corsair I think, uh, and that was uh, written up in PC Week, but nobody, of course, at Novell is, is saying anything about it. Uh, it was going to be based on the Linux kernel, and, and Bob yeah. may have some additional information on that. Yeah, the story on that, it, it, it's actually a very interesting marketing issue, even more than a technology one. What uh, Novell saw was that uh, Linux was an extremely efficient uh, kernel for the PC. They wanted to take advantage of that, and they found they could. They actually first started talking to Linus Torvalds something like nine months ago uh, about 
their right to do that, whether that would be okay, and he of course said sure, that's the whole point of the GPL. Um, what happened though was they developed this great product. They bought in some uh, outside technology from people like Visic Software, their looking glass uh, a front end to it, and they had this really nifty desktop, Unix basically, but then they ran into the hiccup of, okay, how do you sell it? Here they're out selling Unix, you know, capital U-N-I-X, um, and how do they then convince people that Unix is a, a worthwhile product to put on their PC when they're also selling this free product effectively on the PC? And it was their marketing department that could not get their arms around that as a marketing challenge. Uh, my take on it from when I first saw that story, my background is, uh, this is why Michael's answering the technical questions uh, and I'm here to answer the, the, the marketing. Bob's got his ear to the wall all the time. <laughs> The, uh, my take on it was always that uh, this was a great idea, but it didn't make sense to be sold within Novell's structure. It was a product that made perfect sense to spin off from Novell. Apparently, yeah, of course, I, yeah, but I, I'll, I won't say that I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I was brilliant and figured this out because it's pretty obvious to a lot of people, but apparently Ray Norda, who is, uh, was the chief executive of Novell and has recently retired, is now talking about marketing that product as a independent business uh, unaffiliated with Novell. And, and that's where the direction to that product is going. Whether it ever happens, we don't know. It's still... Was it aimed at an interface? No, it, it was aimed at, at being a Unix for the PC for small users who didn't want to pay uh, AT&T slash Novell-like licensing fees to get access to the source code. Uh, it was aimed very much to take advantage. If you look around this room, uh, the amount of enthusiasm for Linux is directly proportional to the number of people who have either using Unix commercially and need to run it at home, or are uh, advanced DOS Windows users who need what, uh, what those of us who were in the computer industry before the advent of DOS uh, came along refer to as a real operating system. <laughs> and, um, uh, and that's very much what uh, Novell, particularly Ray Norda, and some of the senior people at Novell realized was the opportunity if they could build a product around Linux would be to cater to all of those small businesses and, and high-end programmers who needed something a little uh, more, uh, uh, have a few more features than DOS Windows uh, gives them. Where it's going to go, we don't know. But we do know Novell has put serious money into it for the last eight, ten months uh, developing this product. This is not straight rumor. There's a real product out there. Where it's, what's going to happen to it is anyone's guess. Tell uh, in the back. Um, I heard a call for volunteers about uh, four months ago on the internet. Uh, bunch of people wanted to put together a port for the, for the power uh, architecture, but... Uh, Apparently the major manufacturers are donating hardware uh, to these primary developers. Uh, DEC have donated to Torvalds, a big alpha machine, uh, to port uh, Linux to the alpha platform. Uh, IBM have donated power PC units. Uh, whether they went to uh, Torvalds, I'm not sure. But the major manufacturers are seeing all of this enthusiasm from uh, uh, you know, people like the people in this room and are realizing that, uh, that this would, they really want in on this bandwagon, mm -hmm. so. Would the IBM be the prep platform, the PREP, which is the PCI bus with big le a level two cache on the eight and No idea which uh, platform they're talking be about. The, uh, the R6000, right? No, no, it's oh, the no. power PC. It's the one that they're doing in conjunction That's with. That's already been crippled with AIX. Okay. Alright, there are actually two major versions of X out there now. The first one is X11R5, um, which was ported by the X-Free uh, development team. That's in version 2.1.1 right now. Uh, that's probably going to remain where it is. They're, they've begun developing X11R6, and in fact, uh, the beta version of X11R, X11R6 or X-Free 3.0 is, is on the latest Linux CDs, the Slackware Pro, the Infomagic, and so forth. Uh, I haven't had the nerve to use it yet. <laughs> it's still still fairly early. Okay. And what are, what are the best video cards? Um, well, video cards, it's, it, Linux works with a, with a lot of video cards. 
uh, I'll tell you the one to stay away from. I don't like to wear. <laughs> the one to stay. Uh, you, you can probably answer this. It's probably it's a diamond card, right? No, no too. I don't know what chipset that's based on. It may very well work. You may not have it configured properly, but the one to stay away from is the diamond. Diamond refuses to release the specifications for that card uh, or that chipset without a non-disclosure agreement, which means you can't distribute the source to the drivers. So it's catch-22. Is that X aimed at server or client? The X windows? Yes. Oh, both. Both. I mean, with the, with, the, with the networking capabilities of Linux, I mean, it can act as both. I mean, you've got X clients built in there, uh, which can connect over the net or through the network to an X server or to the local X server, or you've, you know, you've got the server and you can have the clients anywhere on that. I mean, it's, it's like an ordinary Unix system. I mean, you can run, for example, when I worked on Wall Street as a system administrator, one of the first tests I had for Linux was to take a copy of FrameMaker, which runs on a Sun, and run it on the server and then X display it back to the Linux workstation, which it, which it did beautifully. So I was able to run FrameMaker on my Linux box. Okay, sir. I just bought a Linux CD developer's resource kit. I'm, I'm like new and I'm just trying to install it. Is that okay to use or should I, should I buy the wrong one? Well, is that the Infomagic yeah. 2C? It's a red uh, CD. No, it's very current. Uh, it has Slackware 2.0 on it. It's fine. Yeah, it'll yeah. do your. Uh, it well. would be wrong of me to answer that question since I have a fiduciary interest in my own company. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all good. I mean, you can install Linux from every single one of them. Um, obviously, I'm partial to mine, but uh, any one of them will, will get you Linux installed. It's, it's just a matter of what's provided with it in terms of documentation, how easy is it to install, and what do you get for after the installation support. Yeah, Mike, okay. sorry, over here in the red. Yeah, just in terms of the question asked before about the port to the Macintosh, the Power Mac platform. First, um, the guy who was in charge of porting the Amiga port to the Mac, um, tried to get technical information on the machines from Apple um, and was um, basically turned away at the door. They didn't want anything to do with it. So I, the other manufacturers may be, uh, you know, welcoming. Well, well, Apple has its own X to grind with AUX. Yeah. That may be why. But, um, no. Well, actually, they're abandoning other drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, also, the, uh, but if you were talking about the power maps, you wouldn't be porting the Amiga version to it because that's the 68,000. Right. You would probably want to do a direct port from the uh, PC version because it's a different chip anyway. Uh huh. Okay. Yes, sir. Back to a video card, is it worth uh, getting a 2 megabyte video card or would it actually use the second megabyte? Or? Um, that's dependent upon the chipset that you've got and whether or not it's supported in the, in the high-res modes that that card offers. For example, you generally, you, you don't need more than a meg, I think, if you're going to run two, 256 colors and 1024 by 768. My math may be off. So if you're going to go beyond that, uh, A, the card has to support um, that uh, resolution that would use that much memory or high color, one or the other. I don't, I'm not sure if the X free server goes beyond 256 colors. That's maybe somebody here can answer here. Uh, other than that, you, you might not, in other words, unless you're using a super high resolution, you might not need all that memory. Okay. Uh, this gentleman right here. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, not much is written down because, because the people who discover these things are too busy to worry about writing it down. We generally document it when we have customers call who attempt make it an attempt to install things and they don't work. Uh, as to what doesn't work, you're less likely to find a list of what doesn't work than what does work. Um, in, in terms of PC architecture, it works with most garden variety stuff. Uh, generally the cheaper it is, the more likely it is going to work, simply because the developers are more likely to have access to that equipment first. That makes sense. It does. Okay. Uh, over here. Right. Well, the chips aren't, aren't at the issue, really. Uh, I have heard of some timing issues, but primarily the problem is that those sort of sorts of chips tend to be run on PCI bus machines. And Linux, again, 
uh, is developed by people who don't have access to the PCI systems. Um, as a result, there are problems with PCI cards. Uh, notably, uh, I've spoken to a few customers this week who had gateway PCI machines. Uh, their IDE controllers were, were acting flaky. They actually had to slow them down to, uh, to ISA emulation mode. It sort of defeats the, the purpose of PCI. I think PCI is, is going to be supported. No, I, I won't say I think it is. I know it will be supported. It does work uh, to a limited extent, but don't expect to use anything in the way of SCSI. Uh, or, or uh, other ex exotic cards at this time. Give it, give it a little bit of time. Now, this gentleman all the way in the back. Hey, uh, what's the status of current uh, uh, user group activity here in New York? I'm sorry, you said user, user group activity about user Linux? Group activity here in the New York area. Uh, Bob, yeah. I think, can answer this question. Yeah, I did, actually, can I get a show of hands? How many people here got a uh, an announcement uh, from ACC about this meeting as as part of a user group announcement? Oh, mm. Well, they did arrive. Okay, uh, here's what uh, the user group consists of in in New York. And until someone comes up with a better one, which I'd be thrilled if someone would did, is what we're trying to do is uh, sort of along the lines of Linux. In any case, uh, is try and tag into as many other user group activities as we can and other events. So for example, the Hackers Conference was having a big conference, it's all organized, and we just helped sponsor, drag Michael along to, uh, to answer questions. So in that sense, this is a Linux, New York City Linux user group sponsored event. Uh, th there will also be a Linux uh, user group sponsored event at Unix Expo. Uh, in the evening of, uh, I believe it's the Tuesday evening, that'll be October 3rd or 4th. Um, and again, while we'll, uh, this is the uh, New York City Linux user group, we'll take full credit for it. Uh, the fact that Bruno Blenheim uh, put on an expo and donated a room and, and all the rest of it uh, is sort of us taking advantage of it. So on top of that, the announcement that I sent around also included uh, a comment to the effect of, we'd like to have a September user group meeting but I don't have the time to organize one. Ergo, if uh, anyone in this room wants to organize a September meeting, and the key thing to meetings, even more than finding uh, 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 nationally known uh, uh, Linux people to speak, the key to any meeting, particularly in the New York City area, is to find a room uh, that's accessible. <laughs> A so, room that they'll let us into. Exactly. That's right. So the, so the issue is if you know where there's a room uh, and you're prepared to help organize one, uh, sure, let me know and, and I'll certainly provide some of the publicity for it. That'd be great. Okay. The Sorry. gentleman right back there. Yeah. Um, pretty basic, actually. Most machines these days are equipped to run on any 386 or 486. Uh, generally, I would say 4 meg of RAM, although you can run it with less, you're not going to be able to do much. 4 meg, four meg uh, for a minimal installation, uh, 8 meg if you're going to run X Windows, or more, you know, the more the merrier. Uh, in terms of disk space, that's heavily dependent upon which distribution you have, how much of it you, you want to install, and whether or not you're going to run parts of it from the CD-ROM. Uh, for example, with Slackware Pro, you can get away with as little as 8 megabytes of a Linux partition or 11 megabytes of an uncompressed uh, DOS partition and run the bulk of it off the CD-ROM. Um, so, but it can go as high as two or 300 megabytes, you know, for all the binaries, the, uh, the libraries, the fonts, and so forth. So it varies. I think the average distribution from the folks that we deal with tends to be about 80 to 120 meg. Okay. Uh, you, sir. Can you tell me about the differences in uh, version 2.0? 2.0. Well, everything was upgraded, basically. Uh, Pat sat on that for, well, he didn't sit on it. We were working with him, and it took a while to get all the bugs ironed out uh, between various applications. But essentially, the compiler was upgraded, the kernel was upgraded, X Windows was upgraded, uh, all the major system applications, the, uh, the tech uh, program the uh, the ghost script interpreter was upgraded um, the libraries the C libraries uh, even the X libraries I believe were upgraded so everything is new in there the installation program has been spiffed up it now uh, offers you options for configuring you know your monitor when you uh, when you're when you're installing uh, it's gotten a little easier to install and everything has been updated so it's on par with everything else that's out there right now it's it's not old anymore okay uh, let me just take somebody else sir you 
Well, Wine is being worked on. Uh, like everything else with Linux, most of it is, is pretty much volunteer work. Um, it does run some Windows applications, but as of right now, it's really, uh, it's not ready for prime time. It's, it's certainly not up to the level that the DOS emulator is right now. I mean, I, I hear it plays a pretty good game of solitaire, uh, <laughs> but that, that's, you know, don't expect too much from it. It's out there. You can, you can run basically alpha versions of it or even pre-alpha versions of it, but you're not, uh, I wouldn't trust it and I wouldn't use it for anything that you, that you planned on uh, having to recover the file with, files with afterwards. Well, Wine is essentially the Linux version of Wabi. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the answer to it. It's being worked on. You can't push it. It's, it's, it's not going to, you know, like I said, there will be no wine before it's time, and that's true. It's, when it's ready, it's ready. Okay. Uh, sir. I heard uh, some talk a while ago on some of the Linux news groups that uh, somebody was, either was developed or had developed some motif, uh, some libraries that were, uh, that were compatible with motif libraries. It was to, for developing motif applications? Well, yeah, so you could, even if you didn't go out and, you know, spend $200 on motif, you'd be able to compile motif apps and stuff like that. I mean, mm, it, it's possible. I haven't heard about it, but then again, um, well, I would be surprised if I had if, if I had known about it or if it were available, it would be in very wide use right now. Um, in fact, Bob is is the distributor of uh, motif, the exclusive distributor of the Sequoia motif product in the U.S. Uh, and I think he might have heard about that too. If, yeah, the, there's actually a whole bunch of really good window managers that run on Linux on X Windows. Well, he's speaking um, of development, though. Just yeah, development. exactly. So the the catch is, uh, of course, that they are not motif uh, compatible and in particular uh, where we sell a lot of motif too uh, so it, i guess my first point is you don't really need motif unless you're planning on writing applications that you're going to run on motif systems uh, in the real unix world if you like on sun and hp versions and if you're going to do that then you have to have the motif window manager it's really as simple as that uh, I'm not aware, I don't know if Kurt's aware of, of any of these products that do much better than that, but that's certainly who we're selling all of our Motif versions to, are people who are taking um, Motif applications off of a Sun machine, working on them on their Linux box in order to put them back on a Sun machine, and using the GNU, C, and C++ compilers, that's very straightforward and a very reliable thing to do. There is at least one effort that I know about um, ongoing to develop a free Motif clone. Um, I think that uh, uh, that's being sponsored by the folks over at Yggdrasil. Uh, I don't know if that's active. I, I don't know anything about it other than that they said they were doing it. Um, and I have heard other people uh, make mumblings about wanting to, uh, to do it. Now, whether or not it's, it's, it's happening, I can't say. Um, well, I just will say that I don't understand what all this what all this fuss is about Motif. Open Look works just fine, and, and so do any of the other window managers. I, I, I don't particularly like yeah. actually using Motif's window manager. I think it sucks, but yeah. there are some applications that are made. Yeah, games, yeah, you're right. You're right. It's application driven. You yeah, the you're right. Stuff, yeah. So. Yeah, that may, that may be some time. I, like everything else in the Linux world, if you don't believe it's going to happen, it probably will. Okay, <laughs> you sir. Uh, AIX has Smith, the uh, system manager, uh -huh. which is a fairly friendly user interface. Is there equivalent to that? Um, not right now. Not for Linux. Uh, the reason for that, I think, is that most of the people who have used Linux up to this point are either very technical or mostly technical, uh, and consequently, I think they would view that as an affront on on there. <laughs> but as having said that, I'm seeing more and more people uh, of less than stellar hacking abilities using Linux. I mean, we're talking about the more the more average people who are either Unix curious or internet curious, and Linux gives them. Both, both of those things. They can connect to the internet very readily, uh, and they can learn uh, Unix uh, very readily. It's very cheap or, or free if they have a high-speed modem. Um, so I suspect that uh, it's just around the corner. That's and what about in the, the um, remote procedure calls and distributed processor client server concepts? That I couldn't answer. Yeah. Kurt, do you have an answer for that one? Libraries are available with Linux. 
So you can do this to Sun RTC sort of consistent calls and stuff. Okay. All right. Yeah, so it, in general, actually, this is a point we didn't make earlier, uh, given this is in, in theory a user group meeting. Uh, if anyone has a better answer for any of the questions that come up, please stick up your hand and, and wave it around like crazy, and, and uh, we'd be very interested <coughs> in hearing from you. Uh, the, the catch with any technology as complex as something like Linux uh, is that at best you're going to be expert in only one corner of the technology. and. Uh, whoever has spent more time in the other corners is obviously going to have better answers. Um, I noticed there's some interviews applications. Excuse me? There's some interviews based applications like eyebrows. Or right. Well, it's already in there. And, the, and at least in Slackware, it is. It's, it's available. It's freely available on the internet. But I just saw a couple of applications. Well, the, oh, yeah. All the development tools are in there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Unless you didn't get the complete version. A lot of times people just get the runtime version uh, because they're not in interested in doing interview. I mean, there are so many different library and widget sets out there that you could you'd go crazy. I don't personally do any X programming. My hair started falling out years ago uh, <laughs> with, with C programming. Uh, so I, I pretty much got out of the programming business and stuck with system integration, uh, uh, system administration and system integration. I just merged the two words. Okay. <laughs> You, sir. How secure is Linux? <laughs> <laughs> In this room, it's not very secure at all, I don't think. Um, well, Linux, because Linux is so widely used, the bugs or the security flaws in Linux are being found uh, fairly quickly. There was one very well advertised one a few months ago, which would get you root access on most uh, most any Linux machine uh, prior to a certain version. That's subsequently been fixed. Um, any Unix system is only as secure as the administrator wants to make it. And if you want to leave loopholes in there, they're in there. Uh, the, for example, the default uh, distributions, most of them offer you the option of installing uh, basically null accounts or accounts like guest with no passwords. Uh, those could be counted as a security hole because most people simply just say yes and install them. Um, you know, I'm sure there's lots of stuff in there and uh, lots of stuff waiting to be discovered. but. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I would say it's probably no less secure than any other version, um, which isn't saying much. Does your, uh, your distribution of Slackware professional retain all the, uh, the binaries as well as the source, or is it just the binaries? For, for yeah, we, uh, a few, uh, just an interesting anecdote. I got, um, uh, and I think this is the first time I've, I've, I've mentioned this publicly, the uh, FSF came after us about uh, four or five months ago. Uh, we got a very threatening letter from their attorney uh, indicating that we were not properly distributing the software. In other words, uh, for those in this room that aren't familiar with the GNU public license, it basically requires you to either distribute the binary with the accompanying source or include a written uh, notice that you will supply the, support, the source code on demand. Um, we subsequently contacted them and explained to them that wasn't an intentional omission. We were simply mirroring the archive sites, and the archive sites weren't doing a very good job of uh, uh, matching the source code to the existing binaries that they were storing. Uh, subsequent to that, we came out with a Slackware uh, Pro edition, and the, the, the new Slackware has a complete one-to-one -one correspondence binary to source. The only exception on that was the X Windows system, which by itself, I think the source was well over 100 megabytes. We didn't have the room for that, and uh, the source license for that doesn't require it to be redistributed, and I don't think many people in this room or beyond are really into hacking the X server. That's for the X3 development team. Okay. Are there any other questions? RAM and hard drive disk uh, limitations, is it the same as DOS or can you go on to Petrobite? And then streams or sockets? Okay. Well, sockets, of course, are in there because uh, Linux is... Uh, well, to my mind, at least, it looks from it from an administrator standpoint, it looks an awful lot like uh, like BSD. Um, excuse me. Streams. streams. I don't think streams are in there, uh, and I, I doubt they'll be implemented anytime soon. AT and T doesn't have the best name in, with uh, with Unix hackers um, as a result of some of the things they did with System Five. However, there are a lot of System Five enhancements to Linux. I mean, the things that weren't 
too offensive with System 5 found their way into Linux. For example, the, uh, uh, the system of, of RC initialization files, it used to be with, uh, uh, even with up till recently, with I think with SunOS, it was just made maybe one major RC file in, in, in the Etsy directory, which called a few others. Now there's just an entire subdirectory, uh, the rc.d subdirectory. So that's the System 5 RC. Uh, then you have the, uh, the TermLive stuff, you have the System 5 style in it. Uh, and various other aspects of it, of which I forget. But yeah, it's, it's more a hybrid of, of System 5 and BSD. Personally, I think uh, from an administrative standpoint, it's more BSD, but I think from a programmer standpoint, uh, oftentimes it behaves, behaves a lot like System 5 or POSIX, which tend to start to merge into, into one another. It's touted as being the a POSIX compliant operating system. They make no um, allowances to either BSD or System 5 in, when they say you know, what it's compatible with. But if you use it and, if you, and you've used BSD or System 5, you'll see the differences or, or the, the features that have been taken from both. So it's very much a hybrid. Uh, RAM. Uh, no, there, there are no limitations, artificial limitations like what DOS imposes uh, with a 640K. The only time you'll see anything like that, uh, and this has been recent, just I think just recently added to the kernel, at boot time, at least with Slack, the latest versions of Slackware, and I suspect it's a kernel thing, it's not uh, a Slackware thing, um, before the kernel switches into protected mode, uh, it, it's only limited to, I think, uh, a, a megabyte of address space. And if the kernel you're using is fairly bloated with excess drivers uh, and other devices, uh, you'll get a message that says, at boot time, which says memory is tight. Uh, that's caused a lot of people to worry that maybe they were running out of resources when, in fact, the message is superfluous because everyone gets it the first time they boot their system because there's always more device drivers in a boot kernel because of the need to be able to recognize as many devices as possible to get Linux installed. Um, like 500 megs Yeah, I, I, I don't see, if, if your machine supports it, yeah. The hard drives, the only issue with hard drives currently, well, there are actually there are two issues with hard drives. The first is a BIOS limitation, um, a boot limitation. If, for example, you have the bootable portion of Linux installed beyond 1,024 cylinders on your, on your hard drive, you won't be able to boot it. Uh, you have to, Linux, once it boots, takes over and if it's set up right, will properly recognize or interpret the hardware as is. In other words, it doesn't pretty much rely on the BIOS at all. Uh, it stays away from that. It doesn't make any assumptions about the hardware. It goes out and checks. Um, oftentimes I see people will call me up uh, with a problem with their system and the first thing they'll say is, I tried this under DOS and it worked under DOS. Well, I've seen DOS work with machines that had severely, severely brain dead RAM uh, and the minute you boot well, any version of Unix, not just necessarily Linux, but any version of Unix, it, it sort of exercises that RAM a little bit better, uh, and they suddenly discover the deficiencies of their system. Um, so compatibility with DOS is uh, really not the litmus test of whether it's going to work with Linux, but Linux you know, does, su does support, I would say, on whole, more things than DOS does without having to go out and get external device drivers. Uh, I don't think there is any physical limitation. I mean, if you've got, for example, you can have two SCSI controllers in your in your system, and you can have as many as seven devices on each. Um, no, I meant per, per drive. Per drive? Um, that I can't answer. I don't think. Yeah, I, I don't think that's a limitation. Does of, anyone else know? Okay. Many yeah. Make, uh, it's probably not a good idea to have partitions that large anyway, yeah. Yeah, for safety. Okay. You, sir. Uh, I'm open the uh, extended IDE drives. This is for them directly. Uh, you know? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet is, is the answer. Do they have, do you know if they have uh, a switch where you can become, a, make them unextended IDE drives? Oh, yeah, what did you do? The, the difference is, is if you're all, you're all, you'll only see about 504 meg. 
So if you got a one gig right. ID drive, you can only use five hundred four megs. Does the switch say magic and more magic? <laughs> okay. Right. Do we have any other questions? Well, the the core of the operating system, the kernel. Excuse me. It was written by uh, Linus Torvalds in Finland. Now, the device drivers are maintained by whomever chooses to, whoever is brave enough to write a device driver for a particular device, winds up supporting it, and then usually it's handed on to someone else. Um, it's I don't. Even, I have no idea how many people are involved directly with the kernel. I know, looking at the the recent README files which accompany the latest versions of the kernel, there are literally. 100, 200 names in that list, and there's probably more uh, people who maybe collaborate, and then only one person submits the changes. Oh no, no. There's more or less a central registry. The things tend to go through Linus, I think, unless he's got somebody else uh, uh, managing that now. But basically, things get registered with him, and he'll put it into the official kernel. Now, there. That said, there are other uh, changes to the kernel which can be added. Um, and ordinarily, if Linus doesn't decide to put them in the kernel, you'll find them uh, on the side, for example, to say Linus decided not to include this. So it'll be on the FTP site, maybe in the alpha or beta directories. Uh, and they can be installed. Ordinarily, though, uh, they are very specific to a given revision number of the kernel. And if you try installing them on some other revision, it's, it's a crapshoot. So getting into the kernel is probably the best way of seeing it, you know, continue, continue on. Mike? Yeah. Uh, so if you have any closing remarks, they need to be right, but fine. Uh, oh, okay. Together, I know fits with your schedule as well. If you want, I can okay. chat for a couple of minutes as well. All right. Well, we're about to get kicked out. <laughs> uh, but uh, having said I think that, I'm, sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Here, do you want to, why don't I take over and uh, right. how long are well, you around for? Oh, I don't have to leave until 6. Okay, here, why don't I take over for a second? All right, this um, is... Given that we're about to get kicked out and this is a user group meeting, uh, let's meet outside. Uh, people like uh, Kurt, how do you pronounce your last name, Kurt? Hockenberry. Hockenberry, as well as uh, Michael Johnson will be around outside to... Uh, you can debate technical questions with. I, before, though, we get kicked out, if you had a couple of questions, I just wanted to do uh, uh, my own curiosity. Uh, on the thing. Of the people who are using Linux, how many people uh, got it down off the net? Okay. Now, another interesting one that I keep fielding constantly is how many people are considering or either are using Linux or are considering using Linux in some form of professional environment? Uh, by that, and I'm talking uh, broadly defined, in either uh, as selling services by connecting people to the net or connecting machines into their uh, Unix uh, network at work or that kind of thing. Interesting. This is, um, in general, uh, again, being in the marketing business of, of uh, PC Unix products and Linux generally, uh, it's the constant skepticism we get of high-end users saying, yeah, but it's not really a professional product and people aren't really using it. Uh, for mission critical applications. And what's fascinating, uh, just as a little anecdote uh, that some of you may have heard already, uh, we, I was out at uh, UniForum in March uh, walking by the IDG, uh, people who publish Computer World, who do a lot of market research. And this woman jumps out from behind the counter, sees my badge at that time saying Linux Journal, and says, what do you know about this Linux stuff? And uh, so you know, we chatted for a bit. She apparently was in charge of a survey that IDG do um, every uh, couple of months uh, of use of various different versions of Linux on, uh, of Unix, that is, uh, in commercial accounts. So they send these out to vice presidents of MIS, these sort of places. Um, and she got a significant write-in component of these MIS directors admitting to using Linux as their new operating system that they were implementing on their Unix network. Came out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and she was absolutely amazed. So she was asking me things like, well, who's selling this stuff and where is it advertised? And what's the 1-800 number for their marketing department? <laughs> 
And I tried to explain to her that it was, well, Linus Torvalds is in charge of the kernel, and you know, various other guys are in charge of different parts of it. And uh, she said, okay, so what's their phone number? And uh, trying to explain to her that she needed an internet connection to, uh, to get a hold of these people. But uh, it's probably the most interesting aspect of Linux, is the stuff really works. It's really stable on the PC, and it's showing up literally everywhere. Uh, so if you can't get uh, your questions answered by uh, Kurt or Michael uh, or someone else here, uh, you can certainly get your questions answered out on the net uh, uh, in the Linux news groups, comp.os.linux dot announce, misc, help, and development. And then, of course, there's the Linux journal. Uh, and then there's user groups literally all over the country springing up. Uh, <laughs> that's true. That, that, but that's been true with Unix uh, all along. Amen. OK, well, thanks very much for coming. And thank you, Michael, for uh, speaking. <laughs> I don't know if I should say that. I don't know if I know